few minutes of our own personal confession and reflection on this one. And we join together as a community. Gracious God, have mercy on us. Oh. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you, our thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, us, so that we may give light to your world, and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. I don't know if you kept hearing the us there many times, right? Forgive us, leave us. And as part of what we do as community is that we're calling on that for each other, and really praying for each other. Hear these words of good news proclaimed for us and for us. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and has made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. May Almighty God strengthen us with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in our hearts through faith. Amen. In your bulletin, you should find words uh, to your, our first song, Shout to the North of the South. Good morning and welcome again. I hope I have met most of you at one point or another, but my name is Amy, and I invite you to sing along with me with this song about men and women and church singing the good news of Jesus, letting it rise up and go out to all four directions all around the earth. And, uh, Thanks be to our Lord and Savior Jesus who gives us something to see.
Lord, in one little spot in this world, right here, right now, at 1390 Lucknow, we gather. We gather as one community, but your church is gathered, scattered throughout this community, throughout this state, throughout this country, throughout this world. And as we gather in places where there are big roofs over our heads, where sometimes it's straw roofs or open in air, from the north and the south, from the east and the west, we bring our thanks and our praise for all that you have done and ask that you continue to lead and guide and inspire each and every one of us. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Congregation, be seated. There are some younger folks out there, and I'm going to invite you, if you want, come down and join me for a few minutes. Right up front here again. Come on down. Come on and take it. We'll sit down for this one. I've got, I've got some things written. I'm going to see how you can do with maybe doing some reading and calling out some words. In our world, there's lots of nice words, aren't there? And once in a while, there's some maybe not some nice words too, right? Some good words and some bad words. So here, if I hold these up, you guys try calling out kind of loud to see if they can hear you with some different words. What's that word? Kind. Is that a good word or a bad word? You kind of like having that heard or spoken over you. How about this one? Beautiful. Good word or bad word? Good word. How about this word? Ugly. Good word or bad word? Bad word. We don't like hearing that, right? How about that one? Smart. Do we like hearing that? Yeah, all the time. How about that one? Dumb. That's it. We don't really like that. Here, I got one more. What do you think it's going to be, good or bad? Good. Okay? Bad. Ooh, let's see. What is it? Me. Good word or bad word? Bad word. We don't, we don't really like hearing it, especially when those words, if those good words are spoken over us, right? Like, oh, you beautiful. Boy, do you look smart. Those, those are really nice, right? If somebody ever comes and says, boy, you look dumb. Ouch, that hurts. But, you know, sometimes words are good. Some words are bad. But I would say this as well. Sometimes there are words or sentences, lines, that are hard. So let me think. If I'm going to read this off and you tell me if it's a little bit hard or a lot. Take care of people who are poor. Is that hard to do or easy to do? Easy. easy? Some would say that's really easy. But it takes a lot of work to care really, really well. And sometimes that can be hard, right? What about this line? Um, take care of the earth. Is that easy or hard? There's some very easy things, right? Somebody this morning said, here's my recycling. Where should I put that right here? Right? There's some easy things to do. But is it also really hard? We're hearing more and more things about this fragile world. And this week is, do you know what kind of special day there is about the world this week? Take care of the world day. We call it Earth Day, right? So we take care of that. And we'll keep learning and working hard. Really smart. Good going. How about this? Um, share from what you have. Is that easy or hard? Really hard. Sometimes it's easy. Maybe if I share just a little bit. But if we are thinking that we should share a lot, that can be. That's to say that sometimes lines are not necessarily good or bad, but sometimes they're a little bit easier and a little bit harder. Those lines that I read, those would be all things that God would say we should care for the poor, right? That we should care well for our earth.
that um, we should share with each other. Even if it's hard, it's really good to do this. Will you guys pray with me? And we'll have these bigger kids pray along with us as well. Dear God, thank you for the ability to hear and share words. And help us to use them well. And help us when there are lines that are hard to live into. Amen. You guys, thanks for coming up and being a part. You know what? We're going to listen to a story that has a bunch of good words. You can listen to the story, but then here's the sheet where you can hear and do some more thinking. Um, some of the words go beyond what we're going to read today, but you might be able to do some of this work here this morning or back at night. So thanks for coming up. We're going to turn to the reading of our lesson. You guys can come back to your seats. Sunday school, yeah, don't go back into your seats if you want. Sunday school is always happening now in between at this point in the church, so if you want, they are set for a really nice time together. Okay. I want you to say that the evening will be asking the biblical stories of the early church to come out first. Now, during those days, when the disciples are increasing in number, the whole of the people are going to see them because their will could be the and the distribution of food. Yeah, right. <laughs> Now, the And we all called together the whole community of disciples and said, It is not right that we should declare the word of God in order to get other people. Therefore, friends, so up from among yourselves, seven men of good standing, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we may appoint to this task. While we, who are our part, will devote ourselves to prayer and serving the Lord. And when they said, Please, the whole community, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, together with Philip, Prochorus, Nicander, Tannen, Amesius, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Enya, and had these men stand before the apostles, who prayed and laid their hands on them. The word of God continued to spread. And the number of the disciples increased greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Word of God, word of life, thanks be to God. Uh, insights about uh, 
uh, about this scene. Um, he did this nice Easter scene for us. Um, here's mine. Um, not great. As a matter of fact, I've already got ideas about grabbing some paint and reworking, oh, maybe this section and this section and this bird that's supposed to be a dove, but somebody said it's so big it looks like an angel. Um, <laughs> If you can't see way in the back, you could maybe at least pick out, here's three crosses, and down here is supposed to be an empty tomb. Barb looks at it and just sees a yellow rock, but it's actually an empty tomb there, right? Um, the results that people did were, were, were quite different. It, it felt like it was speed painting. Uh, in, in an hour, we were doing all of, uh, all of this. But it was with some real joy about what happened. But the other day, so that's sitting on the back of a bookshelf for me, and I decided just to look at it. Not that I like the painting very much, I really don't see myself as a painter. But what captured me was the joy of the moment that Easter has. It's these lights shining in, and if the world is breaking new because of what God did in Christ. And I was just delighted to sit and smile about knowing the Easter news and that we're a part of that Easter news. Um, that Easter news is so good for each and every one of us and for the world. And the reality is that that Easter news shaped the lives of the early followers. It shaped the direction of the early church. And for the next six weeks, that's what we're living into. Scripture stories that lay out some uh, moments in the early life of the uh, early life of the church. That's the backdrop for the message today that we heard from Diane Reed from Acts 6. Um, we can read these stories and know and respect and understand that there's some really good history to be had. Now this week at Bible study, here's the peanuts um, comic that somebody, Carol Erickson, decided to come and share. And it's uh, uh, Linus and, uh, and Chuck, and it's just this church history at the top, right? The next one, uh, she looks like she's writing. The third one, it says, when writing about church history, we have to go back to the very beginning. And the last line says, our pastor was born in 1930. <laughs> right? For some, church history is, you know, 1930 or some other date. For most of us, the rest of us, thinkers, the church history goes back in the Christian church at least 2,000 years. And part of what's important is to take note that the early church was marked by struggles and conflict. The verses right after our reading today, you keep reading them to the next chapter if you want more about Stephen. Stephen is preaching and he's speaking out against some of the religious leaders, so much so that they concoct stories about him much like they did Jesus. They haul him outside to a wall, and that's where a number of folks lay their cloaks at Saul's feet, who will later become Paul, and they start picking up stones, and they stone Stephen to death, the first martyr of the faith. The history of the church isn't marked with all kindness and peace and joy. Our story is less gruesome, but it's nonetheless telling about the early church, and it's helpful for us to take a look at our church today, but not just about history. It's also for us to wonder how does that fit for the church today, and even what do I learn or see or find inspiration about my own life as an individual or tied into the church. So that's the bigger con construct of how I want you to try hearing today. Um, but I want to start with this. I want you to wonder for just a minute. Where and how have you experienced conflict in your world? Where and how have you lived into knowing that there's conflict? Maybe it's issues around larger societal issues. Maybe it's around policing practices, right? That's certainly risen. Commitments around affordable housing. Racial bias and inequities. 
How do we care more fully or most fully for our rule? Right? More personally, I imagine that many of you have some kind of conflicts that go on in your own family as well. And if we've dug down and heard stories, we probably know that there are internal conflicts that we carry by ourselves. Sometimes somebody else knows some of that, but oftentimes we just carry by ourselves. <clears throat> and there are times where there's conflict with people or practices of the church, even this church too. Conflict is real. It's often unavoidable, but it's important to work through. Now I know that there's an awful lot of people who um, are really good at trying to simply run away from conflict. How many of you, when conflict arises, you just rather not face it or know about it or deal with it, right? Like a bunch of ostriches. We'll just stick our head in the stand and wait for a while, and when we come back up, we hope it might be different. Sometimes that works. Most of the time, that really doesn't, though, right? Most of us say it's better about trying to find ways through conflict. That was part of a, even some of the good pre-marriage conversations that take place. It's around conflict and how do you resolve conflict to be healthy and whole. Well, today what I'm offering you is this. There's a model of some really good conflict resolution that happens in the early church. With some takeaways for us as individuals and for us as a congregation. But first you have to understand a little bit about the history. Let me bring you back into that context in and see if we can understand a little bit more. In Jerusalem at this time of the early church, part of what's named or reminded in the taught in the lesson today is that there are two kind of, uh, and we could call them ethnic groups, that were gathered. Two people groups that were trying to try forging a way to be a Christian community, a sole Christian community. There were those who had lived in Jerusalem, all their lives, generations. They're referred to as the Hebrews here. There's another group of people that were the Hellenists. They were people often who had lived in Jerusalem, but who, when the various times of, uh, of Exodus came, they were shoved out of the country, forced to live in other places, many of them up in Greek areas, and now they've come back home. Right? You know about people wanting to go back home. And so we've got some folks who are coming back home. And so you've got these, these Hellenists who are trying to find some new roads. Right? Along with the community of Hebrews who had been more settled there. Part of what that means is that those Hellenists, and you can imagine this and notice maybe for yourself, maybe as you think or walk with any kind of refugees that find themselves settled in a place, you walk in and there's not a lot of instant community or instant family that oftentimes you follow. That was the case here. The other thing that's important to keep as a backdrop is that the Jewish community was really strong and committed about caring for widows. That's what gets named in here. It was part of a key foundation for them, is that they would care for widows, and widows certainly meant one specific kind of people, but it meant to be a little bit more inclusive. Those who were poor, those who were marginalized, those who were on the sides. And what was happening is that as people were leaving their Jewish community and becoming believers or trusters in Jesus, they didn't have all the care that they had in the community before. And they come at some of those who were the most fragile in life, now end up coming to the leaders of the church and essentially saying, we have an issue. Because the widows aren't getting cared for well enough. As good church leaders, this is the time where you dig a hole in the sand and you just put your head in and hope it changes, right? One of the beautiful things about the early churches that they decided no. No. They're going to commit to being a people and as hard as it was going to be, they said, we want to be one together. 
And their solution, their solution was really quite interesting. Because they knew that part of the gospel work was to go evangelize. It was to share the story about Jesus. It was try, to try to help people understand that we've got a great God who's done great things. And you can live and know that God and that God who loves you. <coughs> Some of those good messages. And the work of the church has always been to share that good word. But it's also been to serve. And to serve really well. And really deep. To try understanding these. And even digging so that you know even more so the hard needs around us. And that's what happened. And they said, in order to do this life as the church well, we need to make sure that there are some who are doing the ministry of the word. That they're leading worship, that they're preaching, that they're teaching. But we have to have some that are really focused on doing the serving. And when we can find some folks and set them aside to different kinds of specialties, then the church is better off. And that got great ownership on the part of everybody in the community. It actually laid out a picture earlier in Acts it talks about that all the believers were of one heart and mind. Can you see that they're trying to live into that? Trying to be one heart and mind. They had said, we want to be a place in a community where there are no needy persons. It was a beautiful work of the church trying to address a conflict by trying to do resolving work, right? Not just listening and hearing complaining, but what do we do? It's interesting how Luke ends, it doesn't really end, but verse 7, the near the end of our lesson today, it reads like this. The word of God continued to spread. And the number of disciples increased in Jerusalem. And it was Luke, it was Luke not just doing like a TV announcer, here's the news, here's what happened. But it was Luke proclaiming, because of what we've done and the way we've done it, look what continues to happen. People are being served and the word is spreading and people continue to go. And that means that God's hand is blessing our work, is blessing our decision. That's what Luke is saying. We did a really good thing here as the church. Deciding what to do and how to do that. Well, so now, if I bring it into today, for us and for you. Now you have to wonder, how are we doing in our Redeemer in these two directions? Are we good enough? Are we very good? Are we not very good? Our calling is to do both well, word and service, all the time, constantly. With good planning and good follow-through. I tend to think we're doing pretty well with this, but I know we could also do better. But I also know that to do better isn't about the church somehow doing this. Oh yeah, we should do that. Raise your hand if you're a part of the we. Right? Put your hands up, everybody. Don't... Right? It sounds really good. Oh yeah, we as a church should do that, which means you should do this. Right? Or I should do this. Or the board should do this. It's about having individual people engaged in the ministry to ensure that the key purposes of the church continue to get lived out as the church. But also as individuals with that kind of biblical direction for situations addressing conflict. But being mindful of the ministry of word and service. So many people want our Redeemer to be a healthy and a whole and a hope-filled and a holy church, but that comes with engagement in the mission of the church. This is a time when the church is going through lots of change. Even recovering what it means to be the church again. What this place we have as a faith home will look like is going to be shaped by leaders and by individuals. 
Because we want to be an effective and a vital and a meaningful congregation. If you're with me on that, say amen. amen. You're going to keep hearing and inviting and expecting us to welcome people into the fullness of what it means to be a healthy church. Like the early church. Tending well always to the ministry of the word and the ministry of service. May God's hands and spirit keep leading us and shaping us and using us. Amen. In congregation, I invite you to please stand and continue. In and again, you'll find these words in an insert in your bullet.
difficult to do, but that's a beautiful song that reminds us that we also are seeds sent out into the world. I invite you to bow your heads and your hearts and let us join together as we pray for ourselves, for the church, for the creator of the world around us. Lord God, the early church had moments when there was a neglect of the widows. And it demonstrates how easily we, as people of faith, can also forget to care for the vulnerable around us. Keep us mindful of others' needs. We help us to continue to learn what it means to be a healthy Christian community as we tend here at our Redeemer to the ministry of in the ministry of deep service. Lord, in your mercy. Lord Stephen spoke your word of truth with a deep, deep conviction and confidence, even when people rejected it. May we find strength, may we find desire, may we find words, even when it might cause a loss of our approval or some of our own security as we bear witness to who you are and what you have done. We pray this day for the many martyrs who continue to lose their lives because of their faith. Sometimes at the hands of militants, sometimes at the hands of drug lords, sometimes at the hands of those who can't hear the words and the cry of challenge or justice. 4,000 people a year or find their lives taken because of their Christian faith. Bless the witness of their life and even of their death. Grant strength to all of us who find themselves in much harder situations of trying to be faithful. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord, stones like words can strengthen and protect and build up, but also destroy and maim and hurt. Help us to choose intelligent ways of using those resources for the benefit of all. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord, we pray for refugees. Widows, for people who find themselves ostracized because of their faith or their sexuality, because of where they live. There are borders well beyond the United States borders where people clamor for new life, where people gather with hopes. Continue to ask that through your church you would bind us to a world in hurt and bind us to a world especially of the poor nations. As we top a mark of three million lives lost to COVID, we especially think of those countries who struggle right now even more so to find vaccinations and health pray for the caregivers and the communities. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord, in our own walls, we pray that you would continue to grant healing and strength and recovery to Jeff Passing. That you would surround our Bertram and her family as they mourn the loss of her son, Randy. That you would bless the Funeral gathering for Velda Humble as we do so in honor and remembrance. And Lord, hear us in these moments as we raise our prayers for ourselves, for the church, and for the world. In 
incline your ears to our prayers, O Lord, and fill us with power that we might live out our faith. With the inspiration and the guiding of your Son, our Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. Part of gathering is community. Is that there is a big us. We heard that at the beginning in our confession. There's an us about how we choose to live together. But there's a big us in that Jesus binds us as community, binds us as a family through a meal that is ours. I invite you to take your communion cups that um, you receive. And again, if you don't have one of those, raise your hand and Mark will come and uh, help. And if you hold on to those for just a moment, I'll begin by reminding us that it was on the night when he was betrayed that Jesus took bread with his disciples of that day and age. And he broke it and he gave it to them with a new meaning and a new understanding. And said, this is my body that will be broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then at that same table, he takes a cup. And he blesses it, and he gives it to them, and says, Take and drink this, all of you. This is my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. If you'll take your communion cup and peel back that top cellophane layer, you will come to a wafer on top. I invite you to take that wafer out. And as community together, we eat together. This is the body of Christ that was broken for Now if you carefully peel back that top layer, the grape juice in the cup is ready and it's with the words and a reminder, this is the blood of Christ that was shed for you. We drink together. As you hold those in your hands, the ushers will come by and allow you to place those in their um, garbage trays. But receive this blessing. May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, may it strengthen us for what it means in our minds to be the people of God. May it strengthen us in our hearts resolve to go and live into being the body of Christ. Amen.
uh, garbage bin that will be open on Sundays and Wednesdays for us to dump any water organics in that. Um, there's also, Alder at Arena has an organic place. But just, um, that, that happened last week. So, and here's just that little update. Um, this week, we hope that you stick around. There's plenty of donuts, good coffee, and uh, some guided fellowship time by Joe Frank. Joe, raise your hand. Um, Joe, and, and here, I heard them saying this earlier, if you didn't know or hear this, um, we are just over a month away from Joe and Hillary getting married. Uh, I don't know if that was more clapping for Joe or more clapping for Hillary. Uh, but Joe's going to lead us in just some fun, creative, we're calling it speed friending during our worship. You'll get to answer some questions, get to know somebody a little bit better, and then we're going to rotate around. It's going to just have some nice enjoyment to it. So we hope that you'll stick around. Um, uh, for that. That's happening in between services. The other thing is, as we walked in, we saw food. We will continue to have uh, food that's left over from Wednesday. We actually had the food shelf dropped off some more on Thursday. The Hispanic church that got here got a special delivery of food. And the bottom line is, we want to always share. So on your way out, you'll see a table. It's got two or three boxes of resin with some desserts and an angel food cake. We want as much of that to go as possible. The other church has um, boxes of, of, uh, of uh, celery and potatoes. And hey, Mark, in the freezer, bring out one box, if you will, of frozen chicken. It's rotisserie chicken. And if you want to take home some rotisserie chicken, do that. It's one of the ways that um, as we continue to get food and it doesn't go all on Wednesdays and we have these different avenues, um, you get to enjoy some of that. Um, where's Sally with the picture? She's here. Sally, now you're with her. Sally, I need a picture of, from you. Come here. <laughs> Sally's you're risky. Custom. Sally's yeah. risky. <laughs> <laughs> now, Sally, come here. <laughs> and I want you to stand right there and give me your camera. Yeah. <laughs> come stand right up here. And take your mask off so we know all of the Sally who um, is behind us. And smile like the Sally who. No, 
if you want to do a special note, if you want to call Sally on Wednesday, she's not hearing this. Um, if you want to do some of your own ways of just doing things, do that. Um, she was the one who came up with the keeping us tied together as the kind of the name of the midweek newsletters and for a while we usually do that. She's been very intentional about trying to keeping us tied together. Um, she's not always the face that you see, but she is the person behind so much of what goes on. The last little things we'd say, if you're interested in gardening, either the vegetable gardens out back helping, or in the front entryways, if you want to do some gardening and planting and, and helping those who are doing that, let me know. Next Monday is Dorothy Day. We're always looking for folks who are willing to help go um, uh, in the early afternoon to help prepare the food, and then later in the afternoon, 4 o'clock, to help serve the food. So there's some sign-ups uh, about that uh, outside. With that, folks, you are a beautiful people of God. You are smart, you are wise, you are faithful, you are serious. Go in peace. Serve the Lord.